Hey everyone, welcome to Show Studios live panel discussions. In these discussions, experts from all parts of the industry discuss and debate the most important fashion week shows of the season. Today, in the midst of Paris Fashion Week men's, we are going to be discussing Casablanca's presentation for Autumn awesome Winter 21. My name is Teddy Prince Fraser and I'll be the host for today's discussion. Hi, I'm Ali. Um, I'm a content creator and creative editor at Original Shift. Hi, I'm Ayo. I'm a fashion journalism student at Central St. Martins and I run a YouTube channel called The Fashion Archive. Hi, I'm Jenna Rossi Camus. I'm a fashion historian and curator and uh, assistant professor of fashion marketing at Regents University London. Hello, guys. I am Louis Lissarga. I am an architect and a student at uh, the Paris ENSA School. Um, I am also freelance as an interior designer, uh, art direction, and other multidisciplinary arts. Cool. Well, thank you guys for joining us on today's discussion. Um, and truth be told, before the panel discussion, before the email I got a few days ago, I wasn't too familiar with the brand Casablanca. Um, I first ran into it in Paris Fashion Week, I think a couple of years ago. I'd seen it about, I'd seen imagery, I'd heard good things. But it wasn't until I deep dived into the research for the brand um, that I found that there were connections between um, Sharaf and other designers. Um, he was the co-founder of Pigalle and also worked as a consultant for Virgil. And when you think about that epoch of fashion between 2009 to 2013 and the different groups and people that came out of it, you have Bean Trill, Donda, Pyrex, Pigalle, you have Virgil, Donna Yeezy, Matthew Williams, Samuel Ross, Heron Preston, and obviously uh, Stefan Ashpool. It's really incredible to think that those individuals went from just being like that cool kind of subculture underground thing to now be in heads of some of the biggest fashion houses, you know, arguably, you know, Louis Vuitton being the biggest fashion house in the world. Um, so I wanted to, 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 to start the conversation there and just pick your minds, pick your brains to see why you think it is, what, what made that group so special and, um, and where they are today. Uh, yeah, so I was introduced to um, Casablanca basically from its conception, um, but I've been aware of Sharaf um, amongst like that PPP collective um, with like Stefan Ashpool and, and Pigau and just that Parisian streetwear movement that was really blowing up at the start of the 2010s. Um, so with Casablanca, it's just nice to see um, Sharaf really evolve and see his growth within Casablanca. Um, and relating to the other brands that um, that you mentioned, Taylor, um, he's just got his own lane and he's sticking to it. And that's why I like that kind of movement that he's doing. Um, he's got his lane, he's stuck to it. And each campaign, even though it's only been around for about two years, is just seeing his progression and see his elevation and channeling that like vintage aesthetic. Because it is really quite incredible how you can find a lot of similarities between uh, you know, Matthew's work, Sam's work, uh, Virgil's work. But then you have Sharaf, who is just doing something, as you said, Ali, so completely different from what he was originally doing, also from what the others are doing. And that's no discredit to the others or more credit to Sharaf. It's just really, really refreshing to see that it could have been so easy to fall into the trap of King Chinatown to trying to develop like the streetwear aesthetic, but instead has gone to his heritage, gone to his roots, found like a real story and it's just really developing and we're all part of like his, his little Casablanca in Paris, which I think is really cool. Right. Um, I would like to point out that, in fact, um, Sharaf has always been a little bit different because uh, um, I have to mention that I, I used to be his assistant for almost three years. And I remember that every time there, there was this um, daydreaming-like personality. Um, every time we used to go out on the street, he would pay attention to this, the, the smallest details we could ever find in people, just in the street, nature, everything has always been important for him as a, as a person. I think Sharaf is a very, very visual person as well. Um, so he, he, he pays attention to all the textures he uses, all the color combinations, 
Um, he loves pink and red together. And I think I got into it as well as a, as a me as an individual. Um, I learned a lot from him. And I can tell you that uh, since I met him back in 2016, he was already trying to have this fresh um, style and just a very, very interested guy. Um, he loves architecture as well. Um, one of his collaborators, uh, who is actually also uh, his girlfriend, is, uh, has Brazilian roots. So I think that influenced a lot as well uh, what, what he likes and his interests. Uh, one of his favorite artists is a Brazilian guy, sings amazing. And he loves all that vibe with plants, tropical plants, um, pink and green combinations a bit everywhere that uh, we also can can see on the on the collection video. There's a lot of those references. He tries to very subtle, but he points it out um, in a very nice way. And uh, most of the models are as well his friends, which I think that is really cool because it it brings a better energy to the whole process of creating uh, the video, the collection, uh, etc. Cool. Um, Luis, um, I think it's really interesting um, that you point out that you were um, Sharaf's assistant. And I'm kind of wondering, other than that really exuberant attention to detail and sort of interest in everything, I think we, I can see that in this collection. And again, I'm fairly new to, um, to his work. Um, so, but what, what else, what else, what's on the shelf, you know, in the studio? Because what I see in this collection is someone who's acutely aware of fashion history, of art history, of pop culture, of the 20th century, of many cultures that are um, not necessarily just, um, you know, the French Riviera and just the places where he himself has lived. So, you know, br bring me into the mood board, I think. What do, you, what do you think he was looking at in preparing this collection that's different than, than just the menswear we've seen previously? Um, well, to be honest with you, um, he, he moved to London to develop his brand. Um, I haven't been really in connection with that process, but I do know that there's people involved that I see very often here in Paris. Um, I think what I could tell that, um, that I know from the past is that he gets influenced a lot by um, uh, the biggest fashion houses for him. The most inspirational ones are probably Hermes and Chanel. I think those ones are very, very important for him. Um, what he has developed is more like a it's like the new, the modern day Versace, I, I, would, I would think. It's a, it's a Versace that is very um, fresh, it's very new, and I think it, it can touch a much bigger audience, a uh, much bigger uh, span of clients. Um, I could definitely wear this brand. I mean, it's probably not my style because it's very, you know, it's very extravagant, but I, I, I would not have any problems at all wearing this brand, which is rare because for me, wearing other brands like Versace or, or Gucci, for example, um, it's too much for me. I, it doesn't fit my personality. Um, but uh, I mean, I do wonder as well, what is in the shelves of the studio? Um, but yeah, I can tell that uh, he gets inspired a lot by uh, music as well. Uh, a lot of musicians that are, they have their own style I remember there was this there was this night we were at his place and um, there's uh, Tremaine Emery came to the came to the apartment and another friend as well came um, and they brought whiskey and they brought rum and cigars and then they started listening to um, what was his name um, very very not uh, known artist uh, we were just listening to very very cool. Um, black music, it was amazing. And I think that type of um, lifestyle, um, it's very much well projected into all of his collections. It, it's, it's very him. I mean, I, I could say that many aspects of his life are in the collection as well, which is, I mean, for the people who know, of course, it makes it much more personal. And there's a lot of references. I have to tell as well, there's this huge film uh, called the, uh, the Darjeeling Limited, I think. I think that's what it's called, uh, about the train. Um, all of those uh, costume designs that we see in the movie, all the little details like the, the trunks with the little tiger, 
um, drawings, the colors, everything in that movie, I think he he can he appreciated like uh, uh, into a next level. Um, he used to have a nightclub in Paris, uh, which used to change venues all the time, but it was always the same style, the same vibe, and even in in the walls, you could see this green lacquered paint in the walls. It was very very. Um, sensitive to all the details he could put in this place and it, it and it didn't make it very, uh, tacky or it wasn't too much either it was it was perfectly balanced that's how i would describe it like it was perfectly balanced and i think he 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 managed to take that aesthetically well balanced um ideas to his new brand and uh, it works perfectly and um yeah i mean films uh, fashion magazine covers, the ones that are really iconic. Um, we can see some references as well in, in those type of things. Um, so I would say he he's a real ambassador of good taste. I've got to get used to this muting thing. Um, Ayo, uh, what, what, what are your thoughts on what Luis just had to share? Um, I found it interesting. I was just listening to him to get some insight because um, so I knew Sharaf because I played basketball um, and the team I played for, we would go to camps in Paris. So when he was at Pagal, Pagal used to be very involved with like the basketball community, um, had a lot of collabs, a lot of events that were associated with Pagal. So that's how I knew him. But since then, especially like Casablanca times, I didn't know that he created the brand until like the LVMH prize when I saw him. And then I was like, oh, this is a guy that I knew from like way back when. And then I started like looking back into his work. And I, I do like it. I also do like that because a lot of designers, they just focus on their own story. But he likes to look at things on a wider perspective and be inspired by different parts. Um, that's an aspect of his work I really like. So yeah, that's basically what I think. Uh, I think... Just leading on from um, Luis's point, like as um, as someone from an Arab background, um, it's important for me personally to see that representation within the scene. Um, not just as him being an Arab designer, but seeing him incorporate them cultural aspects that would re ring true to my upbringing with my parents being Arab, um, like his. Uh, campaign teasers take an inspiration from like the vintage Arabic movie posters like there's a famous one from the 40s um, from the singer Om Kalthum who done her own uh, movie so that type of aesthetic with the movie posters and even like the art deco of that the golden age of Arabic architecture um, having that incorporated with his designs just and um, putting that into the big stage just means a lot as like me personally being from an Arabic background. Uh, Ali, do you think though that this particular collection and, and particularly the video, do you think he's sidestepping away from that a little bit? Because I, I, I love the, I saw the uh, movie poster aesthetic and I think again, the whole uh, sort of brand ethos of Casablanca from the beginning, it reminded me as well of, um, there's a photographer who I forget um, his name. He was a break dancer and he's a Moroccan photographer. And he started out with this project called Casablanca, not the movie, which was also a way to like, you know, um, uh, sort of move around that cliche and, and to kind of reclaim this idea of the, you know, the iconic fantasy um, of, of the Riviera and Casablanca. So in, the, in this collection, I'm just wondering where it is, because I think they're coming at it with, you know, um, you know Euro-American eyes and I see, I see Italy. And I see, you know, I, I see that I see there's an irony in it. Um, and I think there's that that irony is definitely there in the styling. Um, and I'm just wondering for those of you guys who know Sharaf, um, is is he a bit of is he a little tongue in cheek about the over the topness and uh, the, you know, the, the, tr the cultural perspective of what the symbolism of these clothes and their styling is? Um, I, I would definitely say he's found a, a very nice common ground between the luxury heritage European brands and the Arabic kind of like patterns that we have. Um, so with our rich cultural history, we have like these timeless patterns like you can see on his monogram prints. That's very like Bedouin mosaic-esque prints that he just merges with this like elegance and this vintage Chanel 
Hermes kind of look. Um, so maybe not from a styling point, but from a pattern point, I definitely feel that he's incorporated that Arab culture within, which, um, yeah, I appreciate a lot from him. I, I also think it's quite interesting to uh, look at Morocco's history. Um, it was only liberated from France's colonial rule in 1962, I think. So his parents would have grown up under French colonial rule, um, which probably would have had an impact in terms of like the predominant fashion at the top in terms of luxury wear and how that then filtrated through, you know, places like Casablanca or even like uh, um, other, other parts of Morocco. So just to get back to your point, Jenna, I think that when I initially saw the first show of Casablanca, immediately I thought to myself, like French Riviera, Gibraltar, like that, those two places that seem very far apart, but they're not that too dissimilar because of the colonial past that North Africa has. Um, so I've just wanted to add my two cents into what the question was, that's all, really. It's welcome. It's welcome, the two cents. Give us five or ten cents, because, yeah, it's a... Uh... <laughs> Um, no, it's it's um it's really interesting to hear, and I think that um that date you just said, then 1962, this this, this uh, point of Moroccan independence. I think there's a lot of nostalgia in the collection for people who, um you know, are clearly Casablanca's target customer, which I completely recognize. I'm not. I'm 43, um, and although I think we see in the video there, we see a silver fox guy. You know, we don't really see the over 40 woman, but I would want to tell Sharaf. I'm, I'm on board, I'd wear it. I wouldn't wear all of it. Um, but I think that moment of 1962, 60, early 60s, I feel that flavor in there as well. Um, I mean, I see 60s, 70s and 80s in, in the looks. Um, but I think I wonder if that's a really important um, you know, turning point in the fusion of this is how um, people were making this you know, European luxury brand their own. And this is how people are continuing to do that in the 21st century. Um, sorry, just to touch base, I, it's not 62, it's 56, I just Googled oh, it. All right, okay, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, have now, but, like, I just have to kid it out before I get corn by people that are like, it's 56, not 62, but... Okay, okay. It's 60 well, in the grand scheme of things, like, same, same. Yeah, um, but, about 55 to 65, I think we can encapsulate that. I can move away from this, you know, the, the world didn't change in 1960, 1970. Um, but I think, again, that, that late 50s to early 60s vibe, it's, it's definitely, you know, we can feel it in the looks. Um, I'm actually quite surprised that it took, is this, is this the fourth collection from Casablanca or third? Fourth. I think it's the fourth one, yeah. Fourth. So I'm, I'm surprised that he didn't start with the Grand Prix influence, considering Grand Prix's prom, like, its prominence was in the 60s. Um, and considering that the type of, the type of brand aesthetic I see is more akin to that 60s Grand Prix aesthetic as opposed to, you know, the ski resort uh, collection that he did recently. Like that, that worked as well. But now watching this video, seeing this collection, I'm like, ah, I understand the brand now. I understand that relationship between North Africa and um, su Southern Europe, that relationship between Morocco and with France. Um, which leads us nicely onto the video. Um, did everyone get a chance to watch that yesterday or today at some point? Yeah, I thought it was. I thought it was crazy. I think it's one of his best works so far, and it doesn't surprise me because he always have crazy ideas on his head all the time. He's 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 thinking about he can be better. You know, every time he wants to um, overcome what he has done in the past and do it better and improve. Um, I also want to point out that he started his brand, his label um, with the right, with the right uh, moves. Like he started really, really hard. It became such a powerful brand in, in, a, in a matter of one year, it was already super popular um, amongst the community. Obviously it wasn't, it didn't became like internationally famous overnight but um he started off really really strong even with the casting he did for his fashion show uh i don't know if it was the first one but uh we could see rappers like uh gunner was there just walking on the on the on the catwalk like everyone was like what is going on like <laughs> who is this guy uh what is this brand um it definitely stormed all the media everyone in the fashion community 
Um, and I remember he uh, basically, he used to be art director for this nightclub. And at some point he, he, he said, you know what? I love doing this. Events are what makes me uh, go through all this uh, business, night business, because it's a very hard business. You have to be awake every day uh, at night, late nights. You have to be there at the club. You have to uh, host your people, your, your, um, the people you invite. So you have to always have this uh, face every time that, uh, that, um, that you have to keep. And I remember that at some point he said, you know what? I'm gonna stop doing the nightlife because it's it's gonna finish me. I'm only 30 and I already feel a bit tired. So I think he wanted to, he really wanted to go to the next level. I remember he he was thinking about uh, probably opening a restaurant, something where people could still gather. You know, he loves when people gather and create an, a really cool energy vibe moment. You know, um, and for him that was very important and. Yeah, at some point he said, you know what, maybe maybe I should open a restaurant and call it Casablanca. Uh, he used to show me all his references, uh, a lot of uh, spectacular things, you know, like Las, Las Vegas lights. Uh, but then he, he went into a different direction because it was a little bit like the same thing, like nightlife and maybe opening a restaurant would be uh, a little bit like the same thing. But he wanted really to create constantly. So I think a fashion brand for him was the perfect uh, solution for him to grow as a creative person. I think that's what will keep him busy for most of the time. He, he will be thinking about the next uh, ideas. Uh, and I'm pretty sure he already knows what he's going to do for the next show. Like he, 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 he goes ahead of time. Um, so yeah, I, I remember the first samples ever he showed me in a in an apartment in Paris, he he said, "Come over. I have some stuff. Like maybe you should try it on." And it was it was the first tracksuit he he released with this very nice tissue that resembles like a towel. So uh, th those were the first samples, and I already like I thought it uh, it was crazy. Like the the colors he wanted to use very uh, pastel colors, cream, uh, pink, not like bubble gum pink, but more like a peachy. Uh, pink because he knows that's the right one you know you you can be you can actually be wrong on colors but he actually is very accurate on which colors he wants throughout his throughout his whole uh collections um so yeah i i i, I was very sure that he was gonna um create a much bigger impact um it, when i when i saw those samples i was like dude this is gonna be crazy you're you're gonna do great um, so yeah, it, it doesn't surprise me the, the level of creativity there was in this show, this last one. And I think at the end, when we see the car, the F1 car, all with the stickers around, I was like, game over, you know, <laughs> like, it was, it was crazy. That was a crazy idea. And he, as I said earlier, the details he wants to show to people, he, he, he's actually aware that probably not a hundred percent of the people who are going to watch his videos are going to identify those little details or appreciate them. But he knows that in the future, it will definitely be used as a reference, you know? Um, but that's not his purpose. Obviously he doesn't want to be like, Oh, uh, everything I do, I wanted this to be a reference for other people. He actually, he's always had this interesting motto for his life. He's like, everything I do, I do it for me. I do it for having fun, you know, like I'm not actually doing this to please other people or to, or to make a, uh, like a prove a point, you know, he, he's actually there uh, to show what he's capable of, of course, but he mostly does it for himself and for his whole entourage. And because he, he actually cares about having fun in the process. Uh, so that's why I think we can feel this, joy in the clothes it's not like a technical thing it's not cold at all you can actually uh, you you feel welcomed by by most of the pieces actually you you, you uh, when you see people out there dressed in full casablanca outfit you you can definitely um make a nice judgment about these people i don't know how, <laughs> i don't know how to say that but um uh, I think in a way his clothes are very warm, very work welcoming, and the identity of the brand has definitely been 
established, as uh, Taylor said earlier. Like we can definitely uh, visualize what Casablanca looks like already. And um, even since the beginning, I think it was very strong in identity. It doesn't resemble any other brand, I think. It's very fresh. You could definitely throw some references from other fashion houses. Um, but yeah, I, I really think Casablanca has this very strong identity um, and some uh, crazy ideas with furniture as well that uh, he, he really cares about choosing the right furniture for everything. Um, I want to say that as well, uh, Sharaf is very good at finding locations. Like he has this weird map in his head and he's like, I already know where I'm gonna shoot this. Um, this this collection, the, the video was in a hotel in Paris, actually. Uh, and some of these hotels are really decorated like a crazy palace uh, from back in the days. This amazing, I think it was, uh, yeah, the, I would say this type of decoration is a little bit from the 20s, a little bit, but it's a mixed era between the 20s and the 60s, this collection. But it goes very well, actually. It, it, it does mix very well. And um, yeah, he, he, he has crazy locations in his head. He actually, I think he helped finding the, the Supreme store in Paris, the one that opened in Paris. He's the one who found the, the location for it. So I think he, he takes care of, uh, he pays attention to where he's gonna shoot next or where his runway show is gonna be next. He actually uh, cares about that as well because um, some other brands like Rick Owens, for example, they always shoot at the same place in, in Palais de Tokyo, um, which is not a bad thing. I mean, it's, it's crazy. It fits the brand as well. Um, so, I mean, we, we, can, we can jump in um, comparing other brands and I think Sharaf always cares about what location he's gonna shoot and it fits perfectly with the collection as well. Well, uh, Luis, I have a few things. So, um... yeah on onto there. First of all, I want to just say this morning, I watched this six times probably in a row. And I, had, I had so much fun and I think, uh, you know, we're all stuck, we're all in lockdown. Um, yeah. It's been snowing in the UK today. I mean, I it took it took a great force of will not to open up a bottle of champagne uh, and smoke <laughs> a cigarette in the morning. I, I danced through it. I just felt yeah. like actually with all that joy and that joy was visceral, um, was also really a moment of like really, are the Roaring Twenties gonna come back because it's something that we've been hearing. And I think it is nice to see that for all the, um, I would say issue-based and quite um, cynical fashion that we're seeing from young designers, um, this it, it is nice to see this optimism and to say that actually the over the top, um, it, it, it's, it's there, it's there in the background. We're looking at it through a screen right now and it's, gonna, it's okay to just have fun and it's okay to have fun, to dip in the past, to, you know, surround yourself in luxury. So I think it's, a, I appreciated a, a super optimistic um, vision. And uh, and you, you said before also about the, you know, the Darjeeling um, Express. So I thought that right away too, like we're stepping into Wes Anderson film. Um, yes. We're seeing all of the, you know, the plants, the poodles. This is why I think that, you know, the, the irony and the sort of, um, uh, you know, uh, it's definitely an insider view. Um, and I think it's uh, really interested that you've used the word entourage. I think a few of you have, like, um, I, I would argue that he's also saying like, you know, even if you aspire to be part of my entourage, you can create your own around yeah. uh, with these clothes and, and with these tools. Um, so yeah, super fun. Yeah, definitely. And um, you know, what's crazy that People, when, when he used to live in Paris, people associated him a lot with streetwear, you know, this urban uh, movement that is a very vague, like it doesn't really mean anything. When you say streetwear, people think uh, right away about uh, street stuff, like, I don't know, like hoodies and all that. But uh, Sharaf, actually, when I met him, he's like, you know, I don't listen to rap all day. I don't wear... Uh, I don't wear streetwear all every day. Like that, that is actually not my style, but a lot of people used to associate him with that. And I think that was a bit of a misjudgment they made on him because he's, he's so much more than that. And we can see it in his clothes. Like this is a very, very, um, I would say between elegant and smart, elegant, you know, you could wear it probably at any occasion. I mean, 
it, it works. I mean, the, 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 the identity of the brand, as I said before, is so, um, I don't want to say generic, like it's, it's very general in the sense of um, it can touch any situation you could wear this Casablanca looks. Um, it doesn't have to be actually a serious moment, a, a suit and tie moment to, to start wearing your Casablanca pieces. Um, and um, yeah, uh, earlier in the conversation, I was saying uh, he's a lover of music. And um, I remember now the, the artist I was thinking about is uh, uh, Donny Hathaway. And there's this song I remember a lot called The Ghetto. Um, and I think if we could translate most of his um, collections into music, it's probably one of those uh, style uh, songs. Uh, the textures in the songs and the textures in the collections are very related. Um, it's like this party-ish environment that it never ends, you know? It's like everything's joy and uh, it's party probably every day for him. Um, but yeah, um, movies are definitely a, a huge reference for him. I, I would, yeah, I, would say. Yeah, I think you touched on something really interesting and it's, it's got me thinking, which is a lot of designers we're seeing now, everything is extremely serious. There's a lot of social commentary. There is a lot of, you know, there's, there's a lot of issues that are being addressed and need to be addressed. And it is nice to see, and it is nice to take a break from that because it is, there's only so much you can digest when it comes to these very complex, intricate issues that a lot of us are personally invested in, in different ways. And sometimes it's nice just to take a break from that and see something that is just purely decadence, it's just luxury, it's just, you can watch it and you said you were dancing, I was watching it and I was, I was, I was smiling, I didn't realize I was smiling until <laughs> I, the, the video ended and the black screen came off my face was reflecting in the video. And I was like, oh, Yo, this is actually, really 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 cool but hey i'm interested to see what you'd be saying on your youtube channel fashion archive about the show um so about the collection specifically i know jenna said like the roaring 20s and stuff i think that's a very interesting point because i think anytime there's any sort of global hardship if you think of like after the second world war and like in paris how people were you know being very frugal and the clothing was the total opposite of the excess before and Dior was like I don't like this and completely went against it. We normally see like subcultures and things come out of hardship and I've noticed this whole like fashion week season especially in Milan you had brands like Xenia, brands like Fendi, brands like Prada they all had this aesthetic that was sort of like we are reinterpreting our brand in terms of this new normal which is the Covid era and it's quite interesting to see Casablanca like completely go against that. And Casablanca is more like, no, actually, let's, you know, be optimistic. And that's what it represents to me. And I like that it just went against the grain in terms of that. But I think also what I really like about the collection was attention to detail, because like as a journalism student, that's what I look at the most. There's a lot of designers when they make collections the the references and the clothing doesn't make sense to the point where it just seems like they made the collection and then they're like okay how can i kind of tie this into an idea that makes me look more intellectual which i see i see through it so many times and with this like i was looking at one of the racing jackets and it had all the elements of like from the neck strap to the elements to the fabrics and um, because race drivers they have that neck strap to um, prevent their neck from moving around when they're in a fast car um, so that's something I did appreciate, his attention to detail. I'm glad you picked up on the next shop as well, because it's one of the, I made a list of three specific features, design features that I really liked. And I yeah. thought I, I would have liked to have seen that next strap implemented not on a one piece suit. I felt like it was a bit of an easy, not an easy cop out, but it's, it's easy just to implement that design as, you know, as, as it would be worn. Like, don't get me wrong, there's only so much we can see of, the outfit on, on, a, on a 2D screen. But I would have loved to have seen that incorporated maybe in some of the tailoring, in some perspective, or one of the shirts. So the shirting would be really cool. Um, but, you know, I, I have to agree with you in the sense that Casablanca wasn't, Sharaf wasn't sitting here saying, oh, you know, let, let's, let's make clothes for the COVID world. He was saying, let's bring the COVID world into my world. 
and you're all for the four minutes and 27 seconds of how long it was, you're all going to forget everything's happening and you're just going to be here. And I think everyone just really appreciated that because it's just, it's really hard to stay positive and optimistic at this moment in time. Um, so seeing that, although one thing I will question is, I'm not sure this, this is meant to be like autumn, winter 21. And I think autumn, winter 21, I think warm clothes, like not clothes, <laughs> warm in the war, right? Warm, but like maybe, maybe it's just because, you know, Morocco doesn't get too cold um, in, in the winter, but it seems more like he was like, yeah, it's, it's autumn, winter 21, but like, I'm still going to make what I want to make. I'm not going to make tons of coats in this. I'm just going to make stuff that, that fits my world kind of thing. But, I mean, there's a fair bit of coats. And I think, again, I'm looking at the straight down the corridor to the women's wear. Um, and I think that coats were um, a, a place where I think he has succeeded in playing on a really familiar motif, the, the Harlequin print. Uh, but the Harlequin print is like, you know, a diamond shape that's like turning the racing flag. Yeah, so if you could think of that black and white and then you go on the diagonal and then by doing that, it gets to make you think again about carnival, about Harlequin, about, um, you know, a big party and then also gambling because you've got the diamond in the of the card suits. Um, so I think that, and what was interesting is that you saw that Harlequin print in like a faux fur, in knit, like a, maybe a really fuzzy knit um, and also in what appears to be pieced. Um, so I think that video does a really good job also of bringing us close to these things where I felt quite bereft that um, I'm not going to have the opportunity to go and, you know, try these things on, see them, touch them. Um, but I think that the craft there um, is, is really apparent and, you know, that, that neck bands as well. Um, and there's even a quilted coat that um, is featured as a girl spinning round and round. And it's one of the prints and it's um, also picked out and quilted. And I think that was something where I thought, aha, I'm not, that, that's a, putting all those um, references together. It's this big pastiche and then stitching it down. Um, I thought that was a superb um, piece. I'm not sure what collection number look it is, but it's in the film. Uh, yeah, just like um, leading on from that, like just the um, video in itself, just taking that vintage look and merging it with new, a new look. Um, so I think one of the scenes had uh, on the pool table, the guy had a full set of grills in whilst it will pan over to a woman in flares with a bouffant hairdo. So just <laughs> having that kind of like juxtaposing just is crazy. Um, and like Louise was saying, the collection you could wear in any setting. Um, and I think Sharath does that perfectly, like the intersection between luxe, sportswear, and streetwear essentially. Um, and he does it tastefully with, without like kind of like doing the most for each one. Um, and of course, like we can see um, inspiration from them vintage heritage brands like uh, Chanel and Versace and Gucci and Hermes. Um, but what I like about Casablanca and what Casablanca is doing is that people don't usually tend to touch them designs um, from them vintage kind of like heritage brands that we've grown accustomed to. But he's as a designer, he's taken that leap um, and transformed them kind of like untouchable classic silhouettes like um, the Chanel sunglasses and adding his own twist, um, which he's like revamping and modernizing, um, which I think is, is refreshing as, as like a, a kind of like a new, newish brand to be doing that um, and having kind of like the, the courage to do that and attack those kind of like heritage brands. Um, Jenna, you might be able to help me here more specifically. I don't know the name of the specific Chanel jacket, but it is the iconic Chanel jacket I don't, know, I don't know the name of it is but you know what i'm talking about we just call it the chanel yeah the chanel suit i mean it's uh yeah, and we, and we see it there as a track suit don't we and that's yeah. crazy the fact that he didn't just reference that as a women's wear piece but then turned it into a men's wear piece and it looks good i could look at that and i'm like do you know what i'd look good in that like i'd wear that if if, <laughs> if, if i had thousands of pounds to spend on a track suit to wear inside for zoom calls i'd wear that 100 percent. but um yeah it's uh, I think he's done. I think he's done a great job in terms of, as you said, making those references, but then just making them his own. 
Yeah, and I think Ali, it's interesting you use the word attack, uh, like touching and attacking those, you know, those iconic brands. Do you, I mean, is it just semantic, or would you say it's, that the attack is uh, like an homage, you know, it's a tribute to them, um, rather than uh, knocking them down and saying, you know, you you are falling and I'm rising up. I mean, is it is it putting you know putting that flower in his bouquet um, of things and presenting them to a new audience rather than violence to, towards them? Uh, no, I don't think it's uh, violence towards them, but kind of like maybe to other designers, like I can merge these heritage references and make them my own into a new brand, which other like quote unquote typical streetwear brands mm. aren't really doing, um, yeah. which I, I like rate the the vision and the creative vision that that Sharaf is able to kind of like not follow suit as we were talking about earlier with kind of like the PPP collective and and kind of everyone that branched out of that early 2010s era. Yeah, cool. And I mean, I think it gives, it honors a consumer that you said vintage earlier before, you know, the, 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 the young people that can actually borrow those things, physically wear those things and, and put them in a new way. So I think that, you know, this is what we see in the casting, obviously of the video, his friends, whether they're, you know, um, people at Sharaf Circle or not, I think it really celebrated, I mean, as Gucci has done um, recently, but just that idea that um, the consumer is a creative magpie as well as a designer. Um, and that uh, mixing up these references, you know, if you can't find that vintage Chanel um, or mm -hmm. that vintage Pucci on Depop anymore because everybody's wanting that stuff, well, we can remake it in a way that, um, you know, says something new. All right. Uh, sorry, I would. I just wanted to touch a little point there. Um, I think we can all agree that throughout all his collections that, that he's done so far, he's always searched for uh, that feminine side of men. You know, um, there was this collection uh, where he released, um, you know, the the silk uh, scarves, the silk squares, and he put it on on men, but they were very. Uh, very joyful. It, it looked really good. That feminine side of, of men and how it looks, uh, that Chanel suit in a, in a men uh, look, it's, it's perfect. I mean, he, he as, as, as a person has also that side. Um, and we can see the pearl necklaces as well, which are a big reference to uh, one of his friends, Asa Rocky. He started wearing those necklaces back in the day. Um, so yeah, there's a, a lot of objects and the styling as well is made in a certain way that you would think oh this brand is uh it's definitely celebrating the the female side of of males <laughs> um and um also the um, the sunglasses that he uses uh i think now he's actually gonna release some sunglasses i'm not sure but uh, before, where he was not actually developing any of these uh, accessories, uh, he actually chose carefully what type of sunglasses goes well with, with every look. And um, I see that now in this collection, he's releasing more, uh, much more accessories. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure he's gonna release a few pair of sunglasses. We can see bags now that are more uh, for party, dinner, um, we still see the big trunks for traveling, um, the new collab with the, um, the new model with the collab of uh, New Balance, uh, the new silhouette that they're going to release is, um, is a much better um, way of saying I'm not going to limit myself to just doing clothes. I'm also going for, I'm, I'm tapping into accessories as well, slowly, because I think he doesn't want to just release everything at once. Um, and he chooses very well how to release his, uh, his products as well. It's a, it's a very good strategy. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to point out that throughout his collections, there's this uh, feminine side in all men's looks, basically. And um, that I'm, I'm very excited to see the, the new accessories he's going to release. Uh, the hardware is very interesting as well in the bags. Um, and yeah, overall, it's uh, very interesting. Very excited to for that. touch on what you said, actually, because you said um, in the menswear there's a feminine side. That's such a good point because he even said the reason why he started designing women's wear was because so many women would buy his clothes. 
Um, so that's such an obvious, like, really good point. And then also what I really like is, I actually lo love his women's wear. I think it was Look 14. There was this red dress with the kind of, like, diamonds. And I thought the silhouette of that dress was beautiful. Um, so even as a women's wear designer, I think he's a capable women's wear designer, um, which is really good. So it's not like he's just making feminine men's wear, but he's also capable to actually make really good women's wear. Um, so that's something I did appreciate about this collection. That that um, you know uh, trope of lots of femininity or increased femininity in men's wear, I have to say, um, amongst the many, many, many students that I uh, am working with at undergrad, postgrad, design, marketing. I mean, this is a theme that has come up and I've just had a, a brilliant dissertation. I wanna say hi to Martin. He did a great job of actually creating a system of analysis for a spectrum. And I think he, he looked at um, uh, Saint Laurent, Balmain and Gucci um, over the past five years. And he, he, he developed a spectrum of like, where where is that scale? You know, wh where he was trying to figure out and maybe you guys can say something about it, when does it go too far? Where is that boundary between something that works if you're a celebrity, if you're on the red carpet, um, but that is just not going to trickle down into something that you and those you know might actually wear, uh, feel comfortable wearing, feel that maybe it represents a new kind of masculinity, but is not necessarily overtly camp or peacock. Um, you know, wh where is that boundary, do you think? So I, I, I found an interesting um, reference to this era as well as like the Riviera, like the, the 60s and 70s Ibiza, which is like very hedonistic in it. I don't think androgynous is the right term, but there aren't the, there isn't like the archetype of like, oh, a female and a male and how they look. It's just like this blur. And right. I really love it. And it's not necessarily something that I'd wear on a day-to-day -day basis, but there are definitely... He's definitely created a world in which that IB for that within the Roaring Twenties or the French Riviera all operate within that space of where, you know, seeing men wearing pearls and like um, glitter around the eyes and having like lavish accessories and almost, you know, outdoing the women in terms of how glammed up they are yeah. is, is really, it's just really beautiful um, to be quite honest. And I, I'd love to see more brands push that boat out in terms of how far is too far. I just think it comes down to taste um, and every, everyone with it, what they feel comfortable and some people look, you know, look for, uh, for, for certain things and some clothes and others, others. So I, I'd like to see him continue to push the boat out as well as these other brands as well. I agree. I don't even think there is a line to be honest, because like I wouldn't normally wear a skirt, but I think Tom Brown skirts look extremely <laughs> masculine and I would wear that. Or I think, <laughs> uh, Comme de Gaston and plus um, skirts are really masculine as well and I would wear those so I think it really depends on like Taylor said personal taste and I think it just depends on the design I, I honestly don't think there's a like it's really hard to try and find a line for where where's like too far I mean, certainly sales figures would probably try to show us where that where that line is. But um, I mean, personally, I'd like to see all the men in my life wearing more pearls, you know, wearing, you know, sh sharing, uh, sharing, you know, scarves with, you know, female friends. Uh, but I, I definitely wonder about, um, you know, also, I mean, let's be honest, we're going to see this look trickle down. Um, to high street fashion. I'm sure that, you know, co copying a lot of these prints and the looks and the embellishments is going to be, um, you know, you know, inevitably it's going to happen. Um, and uh, that, that's what we also see that, um, you know, n that non-luxury customer, what are they, you know, what are they cotton on to? I mean, we all have seen, you know, Gucci floral tracksuits um, being worn by, you know, a young male customer. Um, and uh, I, I think that, you know, the, the, there's rather than the gender ambiguity, I think there's a gender. Um, a, a, um, it's like I keep thinking about putting the water back and forth in, in the same cup. Um, I think that you know, Casablanca has honored you know very very elegant femininity here, um, and as you say, the, the accessories seem to be that place of crossover. So at what point, when we describe things as feminine and masculine? At what point does feminine elements just become part of masculine looks? Because even if you look back to like 2020, I was thinking about like 
one of my favorite rock bands, Kiss. Yeah. Some of the first <laughs> artists to wear face makeup, show chest, nipple, everything. And like, they were some of like the most overtly masculine, like yeah. sex symbols of that era. Yeah. You know, the, you know, the typical kind of shoot, but I'm not wearing it, no face makeup. No, no, no. <laughs> like, but it was just, it like, even, even look back on it now, like, I'm just like, they look good. So at what point, is, is it a problem with our language? Is it ever going to get to a point where we stop assuming that things are specifically feminine and masculine and just kind of just use non-gender based descriptive terms that some of them are more akin, you find more in women's wear, you might find more frills, pleats, pearls in women's wear. That doesn't inherently make it more feminine and then vice versa, you know, more straight shaped silhouettes in men's wear. Um, yeah. I have a question for Jenna actually. Um, what what do you think is masculine and feminine? I really want to know because as a historian, like when I think of like fashion history, if you think of like before the French Revolution, mm. men dress so flamboyantly that it's just like... Absolutely, yeah. It's just like what really is masculine and feminine? If you look at yeah. all of human history, it's almost like it seems that what people what people say is masculine and feminine over time, it consistently changes. It has, it um, has indeed, and, yeah. and I'm, I'm super glad you, um, you know, you bring that point up. And it is something that I think people do have an awareness of. That oh, well, what about in the 18th century? Men were wearing pink. They were wearing the most, uh, you know, uh, embellished garments. Not that women weren't also wearing embellished, but you know, we're still we're still underneath the the, the cloud of something that we call in in fashion history the Great Male Renunciation, um, which coincides with the Industrial Revolution and the you know the the you know the black suit, the stovepipe hat, all those um, things that we associate with just men, you know, this is man, generic man wear. Um, and I think it's, there's been a lot of times since the 19th century where there's been, you know, leaps to break away from that, but they're usually, as you know, the word I've heard used a number of times today, they were amongst um, subcultural groups. Um, and I think what's happened now in our sort of, you know, our lifetimes, uh, maybe 40, 40 years, 50 years, um, is that there have been great leaps in changes in society um, that maybe make it more likely um, for a reversion back to before the Great Male Renunciation. And I think we will still always need, a, we'll still always need a vocabulary um, of, of male, female, masculine, feminine. But as we say, if all of these elements that have been, you know, for, you know, for the majority of the 20th century been um, feminine, um, if they start becoming part of the vocabulary of menswear as well, we, you know, it'll, it will be a thing of the past to have these distinct binaries. I mean, that's a very optimistic view, uh, <laughs> but I think that you're all showing, that, you know, the designers of today and I think the consumers of today um, are, are ready to, to, to blur, not necessarily, you know, biologically our gender, but to, to blur the way that um, uh, fashion is, you know, merchandise, design, consumed. All right. Um, I think it's very important that he is trying, or at least he's doing it um, in a very correct way, to start making uh, this feeling of new, this new masculine look, uh, be more acceptable. Because it, it it also goes with the with the current situation we're living nowadays, where this uh, feminism movement is so strong nowadays. At least in my country, in Mexico, it's be, it's becoming so strong. So I, I'm really happy that he's pushing towards that direction to make guys look, to, to let them express themselves in a much more uh, feminine way. And that's very important. And um, I think he, he also keeps a little bit of his, his style as well goes into all the looks. And we can, we can see it back in the day when he used to uh, do, the, there's this event he did in, uh, in Miami uh, with the PPP mansion and we can see back in the day all the people he used to work with before his style back in the day it was very much similar uh, of what we see nowadays he dresses up in in a very neutral way but it, it, it does throw sometimes a little bit of eccentric pieces um, so I, I'm very glad that this uh, this brand Casablanca is 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 dealing with uh, the issues in a very discreet way, uh, the social issues we, we're, we're living today. And I, I'm very happy that it's making it more normal for guys to use pearls and scarves, you know, like uh, even the babushka style that is going uh, very recently. 
uh, thanks to Asa Brocky. Um, so that, that I think that's great. And, and it's a brand that, as we said before, is very optimistic. It, it actually makes us forget all the issues we are having nowadays. Uh, but it, the, if, if we really think about it, it is actually talking about some issues of nowadays in a very, very discreet way that we can barely feel it. I mean, the, um, uh, yeah, this feminine uh, sensation of, of, uh, of the men looks, it's, it's very important. And other, other brands are doing it as well. I think Gucci is also tapping into that conversation um, with uh, men's skirts and more... Uh, androgynous looking models, the casting, that's also very important in making it uh, normal. At some point, it's gonna be very normal to dress that way. And I'm very happy we're going towards that direction because um, men need to explore uh, a bigger span of pieces we can wear. Um, but it's crazy that uh, Ayo said, uh, the, the ask you that question about how flamboyant men used to dress back in the day. And maybe this is maybe this is the modern day of flamboyance uh, in men, and that's that's very interesting as well. Um, just before we have to wrap up the conversation, I'd, I'd be really interested to get everyone's opinions on how Casablanca compare to other brands trying to operate in the space that is, for the purpose of this question, luxe sportwear, luxe luxury sports streetwear. Um, and Ao was just, I guess, like looks like Gucci, Hermes, uh, Burberry, I guess, under, under TC anyway. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to get your thoughts first. Um, I think in terms of the luxury sportswear kind of like scene, I think Casablanca is in a different lane to a lot of brands because of the androgynous looks and stuff like that. Burberry is not really, like the menswear is very quote unquote masculine. They're not trying, really trying hard to blur the lines like Gucci is like I, I said um, you can see like pussy bow blouses in this collection for the men which is also something we see Alessandro Michele do for his men's wear for Gucci um, so I think he operates in his own space with Casablanca and I think that kind of puts him in his own field so to speak I think everyone else who's operating in this like luxury sports where it's almost like the same look like Burberry when they do their sweatshirts and their track suits, it kind of looks the same as like a lot of other brands. I think Casablanca doesn't really look like any of those brands. So I'd say it's in its own kind of like lane. Ali, what are your thoughts? Um, I think personally, his Casablanca's foundation is that relaxed hotel aesthetic, um, draped silhouettes, very um, relaxed fit trousers and boxy fit suits. Um, and that kind of like luxury that's also vintage elegant feel um, but his main theme that he started with was tennis um, and that, that kind of a prey sport but as he's kind of progressed his sports are always inclined into affluence so wherever it be tennis skiing grand prix casino like everything's very affluent inclined which I don't think anyone else is really doing that. And just by his like silhouettes and how he does it, he's just elevating that typical streetwear look. And um, I, I believe is expanding his, the kind of that audience of kind of like modern, modern streetwear, I would say. Um, and I guess it's more aesthetic driven than it is hype driven. And it's nice to see from a new brand because everything currently is about hype and um, like the attention to detail, like um, everyone was explaining, um, earlier is, is just there like um all his prints are hand painted take take inspiration from um the golden age of old architecture and ancient architecture and he's just kept that continuous since 2018 um since his inception so um yeah and even like his visuals have always kept the same that saturated film look his choice of soundtrack like jenna was saying it's that kind of like feel good aesthetic and um, that feel good sound which comes from his like party background so um, yeah so with sports like he's just in his own lane as A.O. was saying and I, I think it makes me it makes me think a lot about when, when we're talking about luxury sportswear it makes me think immediately about uh, Sportmax I think it's 
um, a very nice brand that could actually, I could relate these two brands together. Uh, Sportmax for me is one of the most amazing um, women, in terms of women's wear, it's very, very interesting. And um, if we could link those two brands together, I think there's a there's some resemblance there. Um, and I'm, I'm really happy that Casablanca is, is developing this feeling of, um, I don't know, there's, there's this identity that we can immediately identify in, in luxury uh, sportswear. Um, but yeah, I, I, I agree. There's, it's so unique. It doesn't enter any other category for me. It's its, its own category. Jenna? Oh, okay. So we're doing round robin. Um, I'm just reflecting really that um, it's great to I think I uh, to comment on how Casablanca is sitting within its um, you know competitors right now. I think uh, um, Ali's point about uh, the reference back actually to actual sports and while they're elite sports, um, I think we were starting to feel that sportswear becomes this generic term um, that as long as it's a sweatsuit, it's it's sport um but i think that um and and this i think maybe as we're moving away from this idea of 2020 being the year of the sweatpants um that the year of the tracksuit that we can kind of rem rem be reminded about what apres sport actually was and again i think to just ironize that idea that um the hotel lobby and uh, the tennis court are not just the um, not just the setting for um, for the elite European. So I think that you know it's it's nice to be reminded of that, and it's again a um, another way that I you know burning issues and cultural issues are being brought into the brands, but um, without um, I think hitting us over the head with it. Mm. Well, I just want to say thank you to all the panelists and thank you to everyone for watching. Um, for more extensive Fashion Week coverage, be sure to visit showstudio.com. And if you're watching this via Show Studio's YouTube, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe below. And we'll see you next time.